everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Petra Smith. Uh, Petra is a security culture specialist who is currently a security manager at Shazies. Uh, and Petra is here to tell us about the incident that saved Christmas. So can I please get a warm round of applause uh, for Petra. Along, uh, I just I know that I've promised you a talk about incident response, but really this is a cunning ruse to show you my holiday snaps from my last tropical vacation. I just really, really miss tropical holidays, <laughs> and I want to reminisce about them as much as possible. Um, so this is the story of Christmas, 2019, uh, back in the long before before times uh, when. I found myself with non-refundable flights to Cairns and cancelled plans um, over the Christmas break and decided I'm going to make the most of this. So there are some things that you should know about me to set the scene. Um, I am, well some would say stubborn, um, I like to say determined. Um, I'm a witch, I love nature, nature loves me. Um, I also really love some warm tropical water, um, keen snorkeler, love to, to get in the sea uh, at every opportunity. So here I am with these tickets uh, to somewhere that's right on the Great Barrier Reef, which um, is bleaching every summer and, and um, it's, there's less and less chances to, to see it in its full glory. So I'm going to take this opportunity uh, to spend my Christmas alone with the Great Barrier Reef and all of the wonders in it. So I start doing my research, it's all very last minute because this wasn't, wasn't exactly how I planned to spend Christmas, but jump on the internet and doing my research and discover that there's a place called Fitzroy Island uh, just off the, uh, the coast of Cairns there and a um, short boat trip away and it's a turtle sanctuary and this gets me really excited because the last few holidays I'd been on, I really wanted to, to swim with green turtles, um, and there just weren't any in the water. They're, you know, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, so you have to take your chances. So, okay, turtle sanctuary, definitely going to get my chance to swim with turtles. Yes, this is going to be the best Christmas ever. So I set off, um, inspired by the, the beautiful postcards that they have in the, uh, in the gift shop, um, and popped down. It turns out that Christmas, is a Christmas Day is a really good time to uh, book yourself a holiday, because apparently people have something better to do with their time. I, I don't know, but so there I rock up uh, to, um, to book some tickets to this, because this sounds like um, the perfect way to spend Christmas Day. Um, this is, there are some other things you should know about me. Uh, one of them is that I am a professional catastrophist. Uh, you might have, um, have seen a talk I gave a couple of years back named after my favorite non-rhetorical question, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, so before I set off on my trip, I need to also know what could possibly go wrong. And it turns out when you're planning a trip to spend time in the waters of Australia, a lot. Uh, so there are a lot of things that can uh, harm you in the waters surrounding Australia. Uh, there are sharks, uh, there are stingrays, uh, there are Salties, which is a very friendly name for the saltwater crocodile. Um, there are octopuses, there are sea snakes, there are sea snails. Did you know Australia has a venomous sponge? <laughs> <laughs> so at this point I'm like, this is cool, what have I done? Um, but it turns out the biggest threat to swimmers in the waters of tropical North Queensland is what they affectionately, I came with the affectionate pet names for these things, affectionately know as stingers uh, or box jellyfish. Um, and there are two species of box jellyfish that can do you harm. One's fairly large, um, and one of them's about the size of your thumbnail. Um, and they both have these long trails of um, sort of rows of tiny, tiny little stings that can get into your skin, pump it full of venom that um, can cause a lot of pain and can even kill you. So uh, they're the biggest risk to you. Um, now, as you might remember from what I was telling you earlier, I'm stubborn. I mean, 
headstrong, I mean determined. Uh, and so I was not going to let the possibility of deadly wildlife put me off the trip of a lifetime. So I grab, uh, I pop down to the, the uh, place where you uh, hire the gear for these trips, and I got myself something called a stinger suit, which is sort of like a giant lycra onesie. Uh, it got a hood over your head, it's got little mittens and booties, it covers every part of you um, in thick lycra that the slings can't get through, except for the bit of your face where the snorkel's going to go and basically a little bit of chin around where that doesn't cover. So you're mostly, there's very little skin exposed uh, to get stung by one of these things. Um, some of the islands have stinger nets around them, um, it's just sort of like just a giant sieve around, but because it was a turtle sanctuary, the island didn't have one of those because the turtles are bigger than the, than the jellyfish, so they couldn't come in and out if they had one of these nets around it. So I'm ready for my trip, so excited. This is going to be the Christmas of a lifetime. This is just going to, it was a beautiful day when I wake up in, um, in Cairns that morning and head down to the, to the jetty. And I pop into the little uh, shop where you can hire the gear to pick up my, my snorkel and my flippers and my um, stinger suit. And I figure, you know what? I'm feeling lucky today. I'm also going to pick up an underwater camera, you know, one of those ones kind of like you get in the, um, the, the duty free shop, but I'm going to try one out, hire one for the day, see how I like it uh, before, uh, before I commit to buying one for myself. Um, because I'm feeling really, really good about my chances at seeing, seeing a turtle today. All right, so I head off to Fitzroy Island on the morning catamaran. So it zips out, it's about 40 minutes, beautiful, uh, beautiful views, lovely day, couldn't be, couldn't be more perfect. Uh, with, my, with my camera in tow and all of my gear, trying to figure out how to use this thing um, before we get there. And Turns out I'm a terrible underwater photographer. Um, not all the techniques you use on land and take good photos don't really work, but you know, I got to see some things and I'm happy with my snapshots sort of floating around, kind of taking little, little touristy snaps of all the things there. Um, saw some tropical fish, saw some corals, which aren't necessarily much to look at, but what's really impressive about these is they grow millimeters a year. So there are some of these boulder and plate corals that are kind of a meter wide, which means you know they're thousands, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years old, which is pretty exciting to see them there, and some beautiful soft corals there. Um, so, and then, I'm really excited about this one. Um, baby giant clams, um, a really threatened species, and you can see how they close up as you float over them, as they sense someone coming near them. And there's this little hint of phosphorescence there. Um, if anyone is an expert on marine biology and wants to explain the phosphorescent, uh, phosphorescence of baby giant clams to me, uh, please come and talk to me after this. I really want to know more about why they do that. Um, so this is amazing. You know, I mean, these things are highly threatened, so I'm floating over these, and it's like really, really impressed uh, being able to see some of them in the wild. And then I feel something like a string of tiny electric shocks, um, like a little sort of zap, zap, zap of little needle pricks. And at this point, I'm a bit worried because I've done my research. I've done a lot of research at this point. Um, and I know that that's what it would feel like if you were stung by a box jellyfish. Uh, so you'll have to make do with a file photo for this one because I didn't see it coming. Um, I did have a look around. And at this point, I couldn't see anything, which could mean that it was a false alarm and it was just some, you know, some grit or something, um, or it could mean it was one of these little Urukunji jellyfish, size of your thumbnail, um, that you, you can't see it uh, in the water there, it's a little bit murky, um, and they're kind of transparent, um, and they've got tiny, tiny, very fine little tendrils. So I'm not going to chance it. I'm going to get... Uh, get myself back to shore. Now, I've done my research. I know a fair bit about these things. Now, I also know that these things can harm or even kill you uh, by making your heart rate raise to the point your body can't handle it. Um, so the important thing to do is to get back to shore calmly. Do not elevate your heart rate. So I have to sort of glide my way back to the beach, not quite sure where I am because I've swum out a few bays by this point, and say, okay, everything's fine, everything's fine, I just need to get back to shore and find out whether or not I'm going to die. Because um, these things, sometimes they, um, they can cause you horrible, horrible pain and illness, sometimes Sometimes they can kill people. Sometimes it has no effect at all. You don't know until it's happened. So I'm 
calmly, everything is absolutely fine, gliding myself back to shore, and I get to the shore, and it's not the beach that I've come in on, um, and I think, that's okay, I just need to find where the stinger station is on this beach. Uh, so basically, the thing that neutralizes the stings um, is acetic acid vinegar. So I go looking for, there's normally a bucket full of bottles of vinegar, and I ask some other people who are on that beach, have you seen the stinger station? They all stare at me, you know, like they don't know what I'm talking about, because apparently some people don't go on their holiday to catastrophize. I don't know. So find my, uh, uh, you know, have to walk around a couple of beaches, go along, find a campsite that's got a couple of bottles that look like it might be vinegar. You know, it's bright yellow. They've put some coloring in it to make it easier to spot. So I'm like, okay, this better be, better be vinegar. Smell it, yep, and pour it over my face. Um, and then these things either have an effect or they don't have an effect in about half an hour, 40 minutes. So all I have to do now is I pop back to the, uh, the sort of kiosk on the beach, sort of where the, um, the boat staff are hanging out, and I, I think I've been stung by a jellyfish. Not sure. I've just poured some vinegar on my face, and now I'm going to sit here and read my book for about half an hour and see whether anything terrible happens, just letting you know. And they're like, yeah, well, actually, that's about what we would tell you to do in this situation. Um, like, let us know if, you know, your heart starts racing or anything bad happens, but otherwise you've got to kind of wait it out. So I sit there. I can't remember what I read on my phone. Like, you know, sort of pick up, like, oh, that Kindle book that I half read one time will do. Okay, let's um, pass the time that way. I sort of waited out. I think I gave myself about an hour. So, sort of okay. And went, okay, it's been an hour. I'm not wrecked with pain. I don't feel like my bones are on fire and I'm not dead. This is a good sign. Um, so, okay, okay, all right, time to, to put my stinger suit back on and put my booties and my, uh, my flippers and my snorkel back on and get in the water. This time, I choose a beach that I'm going to stay on this beach. I'm not going to potter off a couple of bays over in search of boulder corals. Um, so we go out, make a note of where the stinger's, stinger station's going to be, should I need it in the future, and there, waiting for me, was this. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? And I was able to have this opportunity for the Christmas of a lifetime to, to live the dream of swimming with this beautiful green turtle because basically I had formulated an incident response plan that I was then able to carry out without even realizing it. Now, I'm not completely reckless. The next day I decided to, to play it a little bit safer um, and instead popped up to the, um, the rainforest um, and hung out there, uh, nice caged bird enclosure. Although Sally, the little uh, gala on the left, um, if you stop patting her, she will bite you really hard. Um, so the next day I decided that I'd actually take my chances and pop to a different island that had a nice stinger net around it. Um, so that, um, so I think I'd had enough by that point of being mauled by wildlife. Um, so <laughs> pop back to the um, to Green Island um, for a very sort of much more calm, safe, touristy, jellyfish-free swimming experience there. So, I was able to, to have the Christmas of a lifetime, a rare, amazing opportunity, because I had formulated a plan and carried, uh, was able to carry it out when I needed to. Uh, and because of the line of work I'm in, I'm in security, I think a lot about incident response, and it's just ticking away in the back of my brain all of the time. What could go wrong and what would I do about it? Um, and that gave me the tools I needed to be able to, to take advantage of this amazing opportunity to swim with that turtle. Um, now, an incident response plan is a lot like a guidebook for a holiday. Um, it helps you to make informed decisions that help you to make the most of your time, try new things, take risks, have adventures uh, in a way that you're managing the risks. Um, it allows you to, to have confidence that if something unwanted happens, you can take care of it. Uh, but a lot of businesses that I've worked with, I used to be a consultant for a long time, uh, you know, I'd go and talk to, to the dev teams and they'd say, oh, we don't need a plan. You know, if something happens, we'll just get a bunch of smart people in a room and we'll figure it out. Uh, show of hands, who's, wh who works somewhere where your incident response is basically this? <laughs> a few, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, we all kind of, you know, and you probably, you might be fine. You might be fine, 
but you might not. So do you need an incident response plan? I reckon you do. Basically, if you're working anywhere where you've got more than one person on a project, you probably need an incident response plan. If you ever have a person who forgets things uh, when you're you know, getting ready and you, know, you realize you forgot to pack your toothbrush, yeah, you need an incident response plan. Um, if you're not great at under pressure with someone looming over you going, when's that going to be ready? I need you to do that now. Um, this is, you know, we've waited too long, get it back up, and you uh, need to, to hold the hold them back, yeah, you probably need an incident response plan to help you with that. Um, they really are, uh, they really are a savor of, of sanity and time and uh, uh, brilliant things to have. Big fan of them. Um, so if you're not familiar with incident response plans, um, let me take you through the basic steps that make up an incident response plan. Um, so they're a bit, of a, a bit of a cycle, and it starts with preparation. Uh, it's a little bit like, um, like having the, you can't pack the civil defense kit after you need it. There are certain things that you um, you need to have in place in order to, to do your incident response. If you're planning to be able to restore something from backups, you probably should be creating backups. If you're going to rely on people being able to get in touch with each other, you should probably have their contact details somewhere in advance before you need them. So start with knowing what kind of risks you're going to be facing, uh, have a plan of what you'll do when those risks happen and what resources you're going to need. Get them ready in advance. Make sure that they work um, and that they're going to be ready for you. Uh, and then once something does happen, you'll be in a place to find out about it um, and know more about it and uh, decide what you're going to do with it. Um, in the investigation stage of an incident often involves a lot of um, coming up with a hypothesis and then confirming it so that you know what you're actually dealing with, you know, what the scope of it is, um, what, what kind of incident is, what it affects, and importantly, what it's not affecting so that you're not fixing it in one place without realizing that it's actually um, in four different places at once and you've missed a few of them. Um, so coming up with those hypotheses that you're going to test in the next stage, you go into that containment phase, just like Sarah talked about yesterday, and then amazing talk about blameless culture. Um, you want to stop them, something from getting worse so that it's manageable and you can deal with it. Um, so the containment phase is all about um, making sure that the impact is managed, both the, the scale of like a technical incident of, you know, you don't want someone who's in your system to, to um, move to a different part of your system, but also containing the, uh, the impact of the, the reputation, the uh, reassuring those people who are going to be looming over you saying, is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? You know, having some good comms there to let them know that, yes, we're working on it. We'll let you know in another hour how it's going on. And then once you've got things contained, you've given yourself some breathing space, which is really important when you're uh, in a high stress situation, um, and you can then work on eradicating. So it's, uh, you're returning something to a safe, steady state, um, and then um, you can repair all the damage, uh, get something back to a state that's ready to turn it back on, and that leads you to that, uh, that stage of uh, recovering things, restoring things, getting things back to how they were working, turned back on, ready for, for um, a return of, of business as normal, um, so that um, everything's you know, ready to go again. And of course, the most important step, possibly, um, is to learn from these things. Now, is, um, I'm a big fan of never wasting a crisis. Uh, so if you are having these incidents, um, they're there's always things that you can learn from them to improve for next time uh, to make it uh, a less, these things are never necessarily fun to deal with, but you can make it a less stressful process by learning as you go and refining your processes um, so that every time gets a little bit easier. Um, so, there's a lot to take in with that, especially if you're new to it, but uh, the good thing is if you don't currently have an incident re response plan, they're really about as easy as planning a tropical vacation. Now, I apparently, I, I've discovered in the process of talking to people and writing this talk that some people don't like to have 15 spreadsheets for a holiday and like, don't like to stress about all of the contingencies and what could go wrong. But so, I mean, you know, you, this can be a very relaxing process if you're into that. Um, I'm, I'm not a professional catastrophist. Uh, but, you know, you, the complexity is up to you and what works for your team, personalities, and how you work together, um, you know, how familiar you are with what it is you're building and with each other. Uh, but 
really, it's the same steps. You can just sort of adjust the, the level of detail you're putting into these. And like any good holiday, you know, we're starting with deciding who we're inviting along. Yeah, um, who's going to be there? What are they going to do? What's their role going to be? Um, you know, having someone who's going to to take a leadership role. Um, this is basically an incident. Is not a time for democracy and consensus. It's uh, really good to have someone who's con willing to to be the um, the decisive tiebreaker. Of, like, you know, we're ready to. You know. Um, is this done? Are we confident with this? Are we ready to move on? Um, someone who can make some executive decisions. Um, and having that contact person to run interference between you and the customers or you and the business and sort of say, no, it's not there yet. You know, they, they said they'd, inter they'd update you in an hour. It's not an hour yet. It's really valuable having someone who's just dedicated to that um, communication role. Um, and now that we've got our, uh, our invite list for a holiday, we can move on to Doing the research is my absolute favorite part of holidays, planning what we're going to do on the holiday. Uh, so you want to understand what could go wrong, um, and you want to understand how that's going to impact your organization, uh, the people who use your product. You know, what, uh, not every type of issue is going to be equally terrible to every, um, every organization. So knowing what you need, you know, is, is not having that thing available just going to be an inconvenience? Is it going to cause you fines or cost you money or be a regulatory issue? Knowing that means that you can then make sure that you've got the right level of solution in place for what you need. Um, and then you can formulate a plan accordingly to focus on the areas you're going to need and not miss those things. Um, versus maybe be a bit more flexible in areas if, if you can afford to be a bit looser. And then we want to, you know, we want to confirm our travel arrangements. Uh, you can be really prescriptive with a incident response plan. It can be all checklists and, you know, if then sort of step by step by step and someone goes through and can check it all off as you go. Uh, but really, you just want to, at the bare minimum, if you don't want it to be super elaborate, have a way that of getting from A to B. Know how you're going to get between those different stages of, okay, now we've, we've got our incident um, declared, and you know, how do we know that we've investigated enough to know what the scope of it is in order to move on to containing it? Um, or you know, how are we going to test that the solution we've put in place is you know, fixes the issue and doesn't introduce any other unwanted issues that, uh, you know, is it safe to put into production or does it need more testing? So knowing how you're going to get from one of those stages to the next stage um, is the, like, a really valuable way to spend your time when you're planning one of these out. Um, and you really want to have a, um, a way of knowing, you know, have we completed, is, is this, you know, have, have a definition of done effectively for your, um, your incident response process of saying, are we confident that everything's fixed now, back to normal, and we can um, you know, declare the incident over um, and have trust that, that everything is working now as it should do, and it's not going to happen again the moment that we, um, you know, we turn everything back on. And then have that packing list. You know, what are those things you're going to need in order to achieve the plan? You know, what backups are you going to need? What um, documentation are you going to need to refer to? Uh, who's going to need to have access to these tools? Um, you know, do they do they have the right kind of access that they're going to need? Um, is do you need this to uh, to be 24/7? And if so, who's going to be monitoring the alerts? Um, and do they know that? Um, you know, is your uh, your your on-call roster just sort of an assumption that oh, I'm sure someone's going to be in Slack at that hour? Um, or do you actually have some kind of you know rostered system of of making sure the person who's on call knows that they're on call. All of those things mean that you're ready to go and you can, um, you can execute that plan if you need it. Now we're ready for our vacation or our incident. It's time to go. Should be confident, feeling relaxed, can lean into it. Um, and probably what you want to be doing is once these things are all in place, you know, it's not a set and forget, you want to be testing things as you go, making sure that uh, the processes work as you intend. Um, by practicing it regularly, I mean you can practice, practice with absolute incidents. If the um, with real incidents, if the universe is kind to you and decides to give you those learning opportunities, bless it. Um, otherwise, come up with some fictional ones. You know, you can do that just through talking a, talking through a scenario, just as a sort of a verbal um, verbal exercise, or you can um, 
do really elaborate drills if you know if you want to, and you've got the resources and the time for that. Um, do we even need like Dungeons and Dragons players in the house or other sort of tabletop role players? Yeah, good turner, good turner. Any dungeon masters? Good. All right. Well, <laughs> not a big dungeon master crowd. Interesting. Interesting. In the security community, a lot more DMs. Yeah. So um, like if you if, if you're into tabletop games, like taking that format um, can be a really fun and engaging way of testing out a scenario where you know the story unfolds and you don't always know what's happening because there's some meanie who's throwing confounding factors at you. So um, yeah, uh, t test it, refine it, learn from it, make it work for you as you go. Uh, the more you do this, the more relaxed you'll be, and you're like, that is fine. I've just had an encounter with some uh, potentially deadly wildlife, and I'm chill about it. Uh, so now you are ready to go and live your best life, knowing that if something does go wrong, you are ready for it, and it won't be the end of the world. Uh, the more you practice, the more you're able to trust your instincts, the more you'll be able to see something and say, I think it's this, I will confirm it, yeah, I, I will make sure that I do my investigation um, to confirm my hypotheses, but you get better and better at it over time. The more you practice it, the more you practice together as a team, um, the, that really also gives you a fantastic opportunity to um, get to, to trust your teammates and to, uh, the more you trust each other, the more that you can uh, work seamlessly together, um, the better you communicate together through experience and practice, um, the better you'll be at this process. So. Keep practicing it. Um, it makes it so much easier that it won't even feel it won't even feel like an incident. It'll feel like a vacation. Um, so that's it. That's incident resp incidents response. Easy as a tropical holiday. Uh, so to answer the question earlier, do you need a plan? Yes, you need a plan, but it doesn't have to be a big, elaborate, scary, onerous, checklisty thing. It can just be some little plans about how you're going to get from A to B for each of those those six stages of incident response. Make sure that you're practicing it re uh, often um, with realistic scenarios. Um, you're getting to know how your team works together in one of those situations. You're refining your processes as you go, so that um, so that you're going to be you know ready ready for anything when it strikes. Um, and I will leave you with the ABCs of security always be catastrophizing. <laughs> oh, you take one or two. Got a couple of times of questions. Thank you for this uh, awesome talk, and thank you for sh sh sharing all these uh, photos from uh, Fitzroy Island. Now I feel like I don't really need to go there and be ex exposed to all these uh, evil creatures. Um, so always be catastrophizing, but I feel like this doesn't really work with the Kiwi attitude of uh, should we all right? So, <laughs> so how do you sell this idea to like small startups where they're like, Incident response time now. It's just like, why do we need to worry this thing? It's like there's a chance of one in a million that it will happen. Like, no. Oh, it's an excellent and very difficult question. Um, I, this is, you know, my life's work is trying to convince people that they um, need to think about this stuff. That's part of the reason I decided to write uh, write this talk. The other was to show off my holiday photos. Um, I think. The best way to convince people that it is beneficial to have an incident response plan is right after an incident, because if you don't have a plan, you might have got those people in a room, you might have successfully contained it and dealt with it, but there's probably a little bit of trauma. Um, teams in organizations where people have a lot of incidents that they're not handling well um, tend to there tends to be a lot of trauma in those teams of, yes, we deal with them, but at what cost? You know, we're, um, it takes us a long time, there's lots of stress, there's lots of tension between those people. So when you're doing your, um, your post-incident review, your, um, your retrospectives, it's a really good time to say, well, how could we do this differently and could we be more prepared for the next one? Um, so yeah, I don't necessarily like to sort of be like, oh, you know, we'll wait till something 
goes wrong before we convince people, but as you say, Kiwis are really uh, often very she'll be right, so sometimes you'd be like, well, see, it wasn't right. Um, or, yes, we got lucky, but wouldn't we prefer next time to not be lucky and instead be ready? We got one more, one more question, anyone? Or Thanks for the talk. Um, would you have any examples for templates and resources for creating different types of incident response plans that you could recommend to us? Yeah, um, CertNZ um, are really a amazing, sort of the it is government department that's based, or agency that's uh, tasked with making the internet safer for all New Zealanders. And they've got great resources on their website that have sort of got Basically, some of these kind of these high-level points that um, is useful for a starting point. You you can go googling and find big industry standards bodies that have got really elaborate sort of checklisty ones that are very prescriptive. You know, um, you check this thing, then you check this thing, you check this thing, which tend to be for very specific types of environments and often very enterprisey. You know, kind of all Windows kind of all the time, um, which might not work for for um, all organisations. Um, but so sort of taking that lighter level approach of um, those those six subject headings um, that prepare, um, investigate, uh, th th going through those, and just having um, just those high level those plans is um, is a really good place to start. Um, and yeah, I would uh, go on to the the cert NZ. I think it's I can't remember whether it's NZ cert or cert NZ. I should have looked this up. Um, .gov .nz and look for incident response. And there's some tips on there as well, which are quite um, quite a good starting point. Thank you for that.